Okay, so I'm here with Professor David Worrell from Oxford, and we're at the Expedition Medicine Conference in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, Professor Worrell, we've been very uh, privileged to have you, and I wanted to get just some basic information about your career and kind of how you got into tropical medicine. I know I've heard some of the things, but you started off in respiratory medicine, you were telling us earlier. So just tell us a little bit about how you got into tropical medicine. Yeah, well, my career has been very irregular. I don't think it's anything anyone could recommend. <laughs> Everything happened by chance. Yes, I was training in internal medicine, uh, specialising in uh, respiratory medicine. I was a special interest in respiratory physiology. Mm -hmm. So in the early days, I worked with people like Moran Campbell and uh, John B. West. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really didn't have any particular expectation that I, I work abroad. Uh, but then in, in 1968, uh, very, a chance happening allowed me to go to Ethiopia because right. I was a registrar, I don't know what grade that is in, in the States, but a young doctor mm -hmm. um, at Hammersmith Hospital, that's the Royal Postgraduate Medical School in London, and a former uh, member of the uh, school who was a professor of medicine in um, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, had made some observations about a very severe reaction to antibiotic treatment in a, prevalent, a locally prevalent um, disease called last born relapsing fever. It's a spirochetal mm -hmm. infection, um, a Borrelia infection. And uh, the symptoms and signs suggested it was a respiratory cardiovascular thing. So that was my big break. I, I was funded to go out and study this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And Africa was just so exciting. Everything about it, the, the disease opportunity, the opportunity for research, of course, the people, the uh, challenge of a, lang a different language, Amharic in this case, and uh, the uh, difficulties of trying to do good science uh, in resource poor con conditions. Right. But um, I was really smitten for life with that. And although I'd already planned to come to the United States for a year to UCSD in La Jolla, I just couldn't wait back to, to get back to Africa. I went back to Nigeria. And how long were you in Nigeria? Seven years altogether. And then you live now in Nigeria and then also Thailand, you did research. And what are some of the other locations you did research? Well, I've always tried to maintain a home base, uh, a university base in the United Kingdom mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. I mean, there's always the question of career, long term career responsibility to one's family, right. but also the tremendous support, the scientific strength that one gets from being. The sort of north-south collaboration, mm -hmm. but um, I did make a fairly determined attempt to resume United Kingdom internal medicine when I came back from Nigeria. But uh, I was married by then. Fortunately, my wife was uh, agreed to go back to the tropics, and we were funded to set up a new unit in Thailand. Uh, Thailand was a where we for seven years uh, was a very rich source of uh, research problems, research material, and research data. I was funded mainly to work on mal severe falciparum malaria and also rabies and snake bite. But uh, because of its position, its strategic position, uh, I was also able to go to Burma for the first time, which wow. is a country I like very much, suffering under a very grim regime, of course, mm -hmm. but the people are delightful. And um, I started working in Burma in the early 1980s and used to go there during the intense snake bite malaria seasons. Um, and I also from the Thailand base, I started working in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. where I'd been as a child uh, back in 1941 uh, on our way back from Singapore, at the beginning of the Second World War, mm -hmm. um, and Papua New Guinea. Mm -hmm. So um, this was extremely good, the placing there enabled me to visit other countries. Um, I finished uh, work, I handed over to a successor uh, in Thailand in 1986 and went back to Oxford again. But um, I was then put in, made director of the Oxford Centre for Tropical Medicine and uh, one of my roles there was to identify new opportunities, both disease related and geographical. Um, and uh, we set up a unit in 
on the coast of Kenya, Kalifi, uh, studying mainly severe malaria in African children. And um, then I started working in uh, Latin America in 1988-89. I went to Brazil for the first time. And um, in the early 1990s, Ecuador, uh, working on snake bite, but also with a bit of malaria. And ultimately also in Peru. Um, so these were new developments from the, the formula of an Oxford-based uh, collaboratory thing. By this time, the Oxford Tropical Network was getting very big, but by the time I stepped down and um, retired, became an emeritus professor uh, in, um, uh, well, scarcely three years ago, uh, we were the largest fund um, wow. achiever in the whole of the Department of Medicine in Oxford. And the Department of Medicine in Oxford is, is, is the largest of all scientific departments in terms of funding. And I've been able to develop other sites, Bangladesh, for example. And uh, this year, for the first time, I'm going to Nepal. Mm. I have uh, collaborated with local people there, but I've never worked there. But I haven't been there yet. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, you know, it's amazing to see how many different places you've been. And then not only that, but how many uh, different uh, things you've studied, malaria, rabies, uh, the envenomations. Did you find that when you were doing your career, and uh, were, were you focusing on an area and then going and researching whatever was in that area, or were you uh, focused on a topic like malaria and going after the topic, and then just on the side also looking at snakes, also looking at rabies? How did you do that? Was it more geographically based or, or disease based? Well, I can see that anyone looking at my so-called career would think that there was a distinct lack of focus. <laughs> and this, is a big, this is a big disadvantage uh, for yeah. fund uh, grant awarders. Right. Um, I mean, part of my choice, part of it was passion, part of it was uh, discovery of a local need, medical need, and part was um, uh, availability of funding. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I am very interested in malaria. It's a it's a terrible disease in, in endemic areas, but uh, I was also attracted to malaria because it was one of the few fundable tropical diseases when mm -hmm. I started. Of course, now it's very generously funded. Right. And similarly, rabies, um, although I found that, always found that fascinating, horrifying and fascinating, uh, funding is available for rabies because it does occur in the Western world. And so right. It's a con health concern in the United States and in Europe. Uh, but as far as passion is concerned, I did develop a particular interest in venomous animals because it combined uh, a boyhood interest in natural history, wild animals, mm -hmm. field work, observing uh, animals and so on. Uh, it linked that up both with the needs of patients and also with the laboratory aspects of trying to decide which components of these very complex venoms were producing which particular effect right. and how they could best be combated in, in the very sick patient. Mm -hmm. um, so really it's been a combination of things. Uh, I have, there have been definite themes in my career. I mean the strongest ones have been malaria, uh, rabies, snake bite. I've continued to be interested in relapsing fevers, the Borrelia mm -hmm. infections. Um, but that uh, was really only a very brief part of my career. Mm -hmm. But it's a, such a, again such a fascinating condition right. that it's uh, not possible to stop being interested in it. Mm -hmm. I've also worked in HIV, of course. So when I came back from um, Thailand in 1986, the um, uh, HIV epidemic was really building up in Africa and also in Southeast Asia. So um, I've been involved in clinical work on HIV in a very poor suburb of Nairobi in Pumwani and we did some very interesting work there on the, um, the different range of lethal opportunistic infections right. uh, affecting African patients in that area. Um, I think I, I, I find so many things interesting, that is, that is a problem. <laughs> um, I, and I would say there's a general advice that people who are able to be focused on one particular disease or one particular phenomenon, inevitably their 
ultimate research achievement is more substantial right. than this somewhat opportunistic approach I had had of uh, looking at what was there and what was compelling and, mm -hmm. and interesting. Well, what advice would you have for a younger physician or medically trained person who's thinking about getting into tropical medicine or travel medicine or doing international research in some of these developing areas? I mean, uh, you, you alluded a little bit to the funding being better now in malaria at least. Um, what, what advice would you have for someone who's embarking on a career and wants to have a career like you've had? Well, I found my so-called career so interesting. I cannot imagine uh, any, any other. And uh, I mean, the opportunity for enjoyment and, I must say, achievement, because you're, you're not working on diseases uh, where there are people competing to get the patients, competing to get the data. You're working on neglected diseases that affect a lot of people. So I would really encourage people to go for this. And I think, to some extent, you've got to be responsible. You've got to be a bit eccentric. You've got to be prepared to take some risks. There is no such thing as a long-term career in tropical medicine in the tropics. It's almost precisely true. But uh, one's hope is that you can spend substantial periods of your life uh, practicing medicine and doing research. I don't think you can ever divorce the two. Mm. I don't think anyone should ever just look after patients. That, of course, in itself is a marvelous thing to do. But uh, gathering experience in a new environment with the sort of opportunities we have with our good education from the West and our access to wisdom and resources from the home base. I think with those advantages, it's really irresponsible uh, not to do research mm. on neglected diseases. That's a good point. Uh, there, there, are, uh, there are opportunities to get, go abroad through the, the services, for example, the military, and um, if you're a, a that way inclined, uh, um, medical missionaries, there are still very important networks in many of the countries where I've worked, where people live long term uh, practicing medicine and uh, practicing their faith. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the thing that I'm most interested in is the, is the academic based tropical medicine research, because ultimately, in that case, you hope not just to have treated a lot of patients to the best of your ability, but to leave some improvement in uh, management, uh, some better guidelines, better understanding of mechanisms, mm. uh, improved diagnostic tests, all that sort of thing. Mm. It's really that heritage of one's time spent in the tropics that is ultimately most valuable. Yeah. And of course, training locals, I should have mentioned that earlier, I've been so lucky and privileged. I've wor worked with so many excellent local people in all the countries where I've been medical students, young doctors, young researchers, non-medical scientists, zoologists, mm -hmm. and so on, uh, anthropologists. And uh, I think that the investment you make in, very enjoyable to do it as well, training people like that, who are the long-term solution to the health problems of developing countries, I put that as a very high, very high priority indeed. That's a good point. Or for our last question, what do you have any projects that you're involved with now that um, are ongoing research for you now, or are you doing more teaching? No, no, I'm still committed to research. The largest project we have is in West Africa, based in Nigeria, mm -hmm. trying to uh, fill the void, the vacuum of lack of antivenoms mm -hmm. for very prevalent uh, sorts of snake bite, particularly caused by the saw-scale viper, echid mm -hmm. species which kill and maim a lot of people in West African mm. countries. And um, for various reasons, the traditional supplies of antivenom, which were never sufficient and were never really affordable, right. have uh, diminished. So my aim there is to encourage manufacturers to uh, make venoms, antivenoms appropriate to West mm. Africa and to try and carry out thorough uh, preclinical and clinical testing so that we can put them out there backed by really good evidence that they are both effective and safe. Mm. So that's the best funded continuing project, but I'm also still working in Bangladesh uh, and in Sri Lanka. I've got very strong links in, in Papua New Guinea. I'd love to work in India, but that's extremely difficult for various reasons. Mm. But uh, India has uh, more of 
all the problems I'm interested in, from plant poisoning to snake bite and epidemic malaria than, than almost anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. And any organizations that you would uh, recommend for a young physician who wanted to do research overseas, anyone in particular that comes to mind that would? Well, of course, I'm familiar with the UK funding. Uh, where the Wellcome Trust is, is a major player, the med our Medical Research Council, and there are other uh, funding bodies like Leverhulme. WHO uh, deploys very little funding on, on research, mm -hmm. the sort that, that people like us could apply for. Um, and one's attracted by the, the very generous, large-scale benefactors like Gates mm -hmm. and things like that. And I think one of the challenges I have is to try and um, promote the neglected diseases, which I've been so interested in, to eventually to catch the notice of the really big funders. Because mm -hmm. someone like Gates could make an, an incredible difference to the uh, plight of uh, children with snake bite, for example, in West Africa. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Well, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you.